Hi everyone. Um, I'm Alan Andrews from, from Client Earth. Uh, I'm here to talk about our legal actions that we've been taking for the last couple of years to try and enforce uh, these air quality standards that, that Ian and others have mentioned. Uh, so it's really interesting to, to hear Ian speak. It always inspires me and reminds me um, why we're doing the work we're doing. Ultimately, it's about protecting human health. Um, I'll just say a few words about, um, so I'll get out of the way of the slides. Uh, a few words on Client Earth, who we are and what we do. Um, we describe ourselves as activist lawyers. So we work on environmental issues that we care about and we think are important. We're not like a law firm in that we don't have fee-paying clients and work on their behalf. Uh, it's really corny, I know, but we, we kind of see the earth and its oceans and its air and its trees as our client. Um, but unfortunately, tuna and, and trees don't really pay very well, so we have to go and get uh, philanthropic foundations to, to fund us, so big, wealthy charities and, and individuals fund the work that we do. Uh, and we work across a, a range of environmental issues, forests, fisheries, biodiversity, but my specialism is air quality. And for the past three years we've been focused on, on working in London. Uh, I just like using this photo. It's, it's, I really, no, normally, it's this air pollution is this invisible problem, but every now and then we get an episode like this um, that makes it all too visible, uh, and that's when everyone starts getting very excited about it and, and talking about it, which is, from our point of view, uh, quite welcome. Um, we, the original aim of the project was to ensure full compliance in London with all air quality limits by the time of the Olympic Games, um, but with a couple of weeks to go, I'm starting to accept that we've, we've probably missed out on that one, but <laughs> we'll keep plugging away anyway. Um, and the, for the last couple of years, the main thing we've been doing is, is bringing litigation. We've been going to court to actually try and enforce these limits. Uh, and to do that, we've been using a, a process called judicial review. Uh, so it's a, a legal process. Um, by which you can challenge the decision of a public authority, where it's where it's been made in non-compliance with the law or without following the correct procedure. So any public body, whether that's a, a government department or a, a local authority, for example, must act within the law. And the relevant law here is the, the Air Quality Directive, or to give it its full title, it's the Directive 2008-50 EC for Ambient Air Quality and Cleaner Air for Europe. Is that about right? Catchy. So uh, I'll just call it the Air Quality Directive for, for short. Uh, and the main thing it does is it, it sets limits on these levels of air pollution, um, as I'm sure you've heard. Um, people often talk about targets. As a lawyer and a bit of a nerd, I get a bit wound up because they're not targets. When we talk about the, the limits for PM10 and for NO2, they're not targets, they're legally binding limits, and it's an important distinction. If you, if you miss a target, there's no real sort of comeback. Because if, you, if you miss a limit, we have a right to go to court and enforce compliance with that limit. So it's, it's a crucial distinction. Uh, member states, including the UK, must monitor their air quality to make sure that it complies with these limits. Where they find that it doesn't, they must come up with air quality plans containing measures which will actually tackle the problem. And, and they must consult the public on the content of those plans and then submit them to the European Commission who have a role in supervising them and ensuring that they're up to scratch. Unfortunately, the, this directive also introduced a provision for time extensions. So where member states were struggling to actually meet these limits, they could apply to the European Commission for a time extension. The PM10, they could extend up to 2011, so that's gone. But for nitrogen dioxide, there is a provision which allows them to extend until 2015, provided they come up with one of these air quality plans, which shows how they'll actually achieve compliance by that date. And again, they must submit that to the Commission, who must approve before they can have this, this time extension. And this is the name of our case. It's the, the Queen on the application of Climate Earth versus Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. I'm, I'm sure you recognise the, the lady on the left. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure why. I think I must have missed the lecture where they explained to us why judicial reviews are brought on behalf of the Crown. 
but it's, it's kind of nice to know that the, the Queen's on your side. Uh, the, 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 the lady on the right, I, I honestly didn't do this deliberately, but every single picture I have of Caroline Spellman, she's sneering and looking really evil. Uh, it's honestly not deliberate. This is actually from her website. Uh, <laughs> it's got one of those places. Um, so, Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs is responsible under the Air Quality Directive and, and the regulations which implement that. She is responsible for ensuring compliance with these limits. She's also responsible for drawing up these air quality plans and implementing the measures that we need to, to achieve compliance. And these are these are the, the grounds for our judicial review. The first one was a slightly minor procedural point, but one that we felt was really important. There was a, a amendment to the, the PM10 plan for London, uh, and they refused to hold a public consultation on it saying that it was only a minor amendment and not something they had to, <coughs> to bother the public about. And that's something that really winds us up at Client Earth because we really believe in the right of the public to participate in, in plans that affect the environment. And the second one, though, is, that, is, that, is the main one. It's that the, they failed to produce plans which achieve compliance with NO2 limits by 2015. And I'll explain a bit more about what we, what we mean by that in a second. On that minor ground, this PM10 consultation, um, they conceded about a month before we went to court on that one. So we, we got an, an early victory, which, which is important to us because it really defended this idea that if we have an air quality plan, we all have a right to, to see what's in it and comment on it and really feed in our ideas about what should be in it. But unfortunately, the, the main part of our claim, they were, they were never really going to concede on. Um, so. We went to court on that one, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that in a bit more detail. Um, it really all started back in early 2010. The limit value for nitrogen dioxide came to force on the 1st January 2010. And using information from, from Ian's colleagues uh, at the London Air Quality Network, we knew that the hourly limit for nitrogen dioxide had been breached within the first three weeks of 2010. Um, this is uh, Madame Tussauds, which is kind of where the camera is in relation to that photo, is where big monitoring station on Marlborough Road is. And that's what the government used to submit its data to the European Commission. It's really their super site for monitoring air quality. But Marlborough Road is not the worst when it comes to NO2. This is Brixton Road in Lambeth. Um, where NO2 is, is often triple legal limits. And uh, Putney High Street in Wandsworth is another where, where levels are similar to Brixton. So it was on this basis, faced with this kind of information, we, we realised we needed to take legal action to try and enforce these limits. And we did that in, let's see, it was probably about September 2011. We wrote to the government and said, Look, we're aware that nitrogen dioxide is breached throughout London. What are you going to do about it? If you don't come up with some air quality plans showing how you're going to address the situation, we're going to take you to court. And their response was, yes, we accept there's a problem with, with NO2 in London. Yes, we accept uh, that it's well over the legal limits. But we are working on an air quality plan. We're, we're working on it now, and we're going to produce it in, in spring 2011. And that's going to show how we'll achieve compliance by 2015, and we're going to submit it to the European Commission and get a time extension. So we thought, okay, let's, let's wait and see what happens, let's see what this plan contains, uh, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. We eventually got the plans, not when they said that we'd get them, but about six months later, as, as usual. Um, and they were quite startling, actually. We'd always known that NO2 wasn't just a London problem, it's, it's a national problem albeit one that's most acute here in capital. The government's plans show that the UK is divided into 43 zones for the purposes of monitoring air quality. 40 of those were in breach of the NO2 limits in 2010. I think the only ones that weren't are the Highlands of Scotland. Um, whatever this one is here, I'm not sure, I think it's called Grampian or something like that, but obviously not exactly uh, highly densely populated areas. And some reason, for some reason, Blackpool has gone. 
for their quality. I have no idea why. Maybe it's the trams, the, the sea breeze, I'm not sure. But anyway, obviously a, a national problem affecting most major urban areas in the UK. But the bit that really surprised us was that, contrary to what DEFRA had told us, these plans didn't achieve compliance by 2015 for 17 of these air quality plans. Most of them showed they'd not achieved compliance until about 2020. In the case of London, though, it wouldn't show compliance until 2025. And when you actually look at this air quality plan, we were expecting at least some, some new measures, some, some new thinking, uh, some kind of real bold steps to, to try and tackle the problem. But we saw none of that. Really, the plan is a, a plan to do nothing. I mean, it's, all they've done is bring together a load of plans, some dating back you know, five, ten years, pull them all together into one big document, and told us how difficult it is to sort the situation out. So, faced with what we saw as a, a real failure to, to address the problem, we thought we had to push on and, and actually um, proceed with litigation. And that's, that's just a list of the, the sub these 17 zones, and you'll see it's, it's most of the, of the big cities in, in the UK. I'll just skip past that one. Okay, remedies. When we go to court, what are we actually asking for? Well, I should stress we're not asking for fines, we're not asking for compensation or anything like that. We don't want the government or anyone else to waste money. We want all the money that, that's there to be going on measures to actually tackle the problem. And so what we're asking for is the court to declare a couple of things. One, that the UK is actually in breach of its EU law obligations. Second, that these plans for these 17 zones don't do what they're supposed to. But the, the really important one is we're actually order, asking for a court order which will force DEFRA to come up with a new set of plans which will contain measures to achieve compliance by 2015. Now when you start litigating, you go into a procedure called the pre-litigation process. So both sides, to stop anyone, any sort of shenanigans and skullduggery by lawyers, you enter into a, a, a sort of gentleman's kind of process where you, you have to share all your arguments with the other side and the court. So before you even step set foot in court, you know what the other side, side's arguments are and you can respond to them. And this was what DEFRA's response was. Contrary to what they told us, they weren't going to apply for time extensions for these 17 zones. They decided it was just impossible to achieve compliance by 2015. So instead, they were relying on, on Article 23 of the Directive, which is, people often talk about loopholes in law, and I think this is a classic example of one. Article 23 says, if you breach the limits after the deadline, you must come up with an air quality plan, and that shall set out appropriate measures so that the exceedance period can be kept as short as possible. Unfortunately, it doesn't define what short as possible means. So they were saying, well, as short as possible, in this case, is 2025. You can possibly do it any other than that. So, we get to, we got to respond with what we thought of their case. And our, our argument was this, all right, okay, as short as possible isn't defined, but if you look at the whole directive, it's pretty obvious that that can't mean later than 2015. The absolute end date that you can achieve compliance, even with this time extension, is 2015. We also said that compliance by 2015 is possible, or at least you've not proven to us that it isn't possible, because you've not actually even tried, you've not come up with a plan showing how you might achieve compliance. And also there's the Mayor's, I've mentioned the Mayor's air quality strategy there. It actually set out a list of 14 measures that it felt the national government had to take in order to address the NO2 problem. And so we were a bit surprised that none of them were, were referred to or included in the government's plans. So these are the arguments that we, we took to court. And the case was heard in by the High Court sitting in the Royal Courts of Justice just down the road in the Strand. And the case was heard by Mr Justice Mitten. Um, it was a one-day hearing, um, probably not all that dramatic to if, you were, uh, if you were watching from the gallery, but uh, quite compelling nonetheless. Um, 
And we scored, we scored an important victory in that we forced the government to admit that they were in breach of their, of their EU law obligations. And until then, what they'd said is, OK, we'll hold our hands up. We, we're in breach of all these limits. But that doesn't mean we've done anything wrong. We're only, you've only done anything wrong if you breach the limits and then don't come up with an air quality plan. We've, we've come up with a plan, so there's no problem. And just admitting he wasn't having any of that at all and um, forced them to concede that they were actually uh, breaking the law. But the real disappointment was that we didn't succeed in, in our, our main argument. This, this, this idea that the court had to step in, take action to force the government to clean up air pollution. He said, well, there's no requirement to produce a time extension. It's, it's not mandatory. You can, you can do what DEFRA have done. You can just come up with an air quality plan showing compliance basically whenever you decide. And if there's a problem with that, it's for the European Commission to take action, not for national courts. Now, this was just absolutely ludicrous. It's completely wrong. Anyone who, I mean, an undergraduate law student who'd done two weeks study of European law would tell you that that is wrong. Um, but he obviously didn't want anything to do with this case. He was scared by some, I, I imagine he was scared by some of the numbers that were involved. DEFRA put forward estimates of, of some of the costs involved. And they're significant, you know, we're talking hundreds of millions of pounds in investing in clean transport infrastructure. So he just dismissed the case um, with what's called an ex tempore judgment. He just read out a judgment that he'd written previously. Um, and it says that was very disappointing. But crucially, we, we've got that one thing we, we forced them to accept that they were in breach of the law. So the, the, the judge described it as a, as a draw, and I think that's, that's probably fair. We, we, we both won on, on each point. Um, just to stretch the sporting analogy, in law as in sport, if you have a draw, you can't have a replay. So we were able to apply to the Court of Appeal and ask uh, for permission to appeal, which was, was granted. So we got a second crack at it um, in May this year, where we went to the Court of Appeal and brought pretty much the same arguments in front of three Lord Justices of Appeal this time. Uh, this handsome chap is Lord Justice Laws. He was very much the, the head honcho. He was the, the senior judge on that panel of three. And unfortunately, it didn't go our way again. Um, we, we'd argued that national courts must enforce EU law. They must provide effective remedies where there's been a breach. And again, we're asking, we asked for this court order requiring compliance by 2015. But we uh, suffered a, a fairly heavy loss. Again, the, case, the, the appeal was dismissed on the day. It was even worse this time in terms of the fact that the judges had clearly made their mind up before. I mean, you actually saw them reading out a pre-prepared written statement. It took them about 10 minutes of deliberation um, before they dismissed the appeal. And, and the really disappointing bit from, from our point of view was they never really addressed this, this question of what does as short a time as possible mean? It, it just wasn't answered. It's, it's not been answered by either court. I mean, it must mean something. If it doesn't mean by 2015, as we say, well then, then what does it mean? Can the government just decide what as short a time as possible means? Surely not. So we're not quite dead yet. The case lives on, um, albeit put on life support. Here is the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. That's where we will be going next. Uh, next week, we'll be filing our, our applications to the Supreme Court. And what we'll be asking for, this time, we want a reference. We want the Supreme Court to refer this question to the European Court in Luxembourg. They're the ultimate authority on matters of EU law. So we want the Supreme Court to say, OK, what does this direct, how does this directive work? How does it fit together? does as short a time as possible mean 2015. And we'll also be trying to get a ruling on this idea that national courts can just pass the buck and, and lay the blame on the commission, because that's just wrong. Uh, and fortunately, uh, in the last week, uh, we actually got a letter from the European Commission, which was very helpful. It said, we've been following your case with interest, blah, blah, blah. We are very concerned that the national courts in the UK seem to think that it's not their job to enforce. Um, 
listed a whole load of case authorities which were very helpful to us. So we're obviously going to waive this in front of the Supreme Court and show them that they need to take some, some action where the lower courts have failed. In the meantime, a, a second front has opened up in this battle, if you like. This is, the, um, this is an extract from the government's red tape challenge section on the environment. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, the Red Tape Challenge was this um, exercise that the government have come up with to try and cut red tape, which they think is, is stifling economic growth and hampering business. And they came out with a series of proposals on how they could cut tape, uh, red tape within environmental regulation. And sure enough, as everyone who knew anything about environmental law told them, there's actually not really much you can do because most of our environmental law comes from Europe. So we're pretty much stuck with it unless you want to try and renegotiate it. So they said, in the air quality section, we're going to work with our partners in other member states to use the 2013 <laughs> review of the air quality directive to reduce the infraction risk faced by most member states, especially in relation to NO2. And this sets alarm bells ringing, because how are you going to reduce the infraction risk by that they mean the risk that client earth or the European Commission will take them to court. How do you reduce that risk without fundamentally weakening these legal standards that we have in place? I mean, how are they going to do that? Are they going to lower the, lower the limits? Or sorry, raise the limits? Or are they going to turn them, these legally binding limits into some kind of non-binding target? Really worrying stuff. So while we're still going to push ahead with this case, our attention also has to shift to Brussels, where in 2013, the Air Quality Directive and all European pollution legislation is being reviewed. So I'm probably going to have to move to Brussels next year, which is, I'm sure I feel about that. Good beer, let's go. Um, and we're going to have to work with the European Parliament, with the European Commission, to try and ensure that the, the legal protections we have in place stay that way. But we'll have a, a big job on our hands. So just to wrap up, um, I think the government have got their head in the sands when it comes to, to air pollution. They, they don't want to really tackle this problem. It, it's difficult, it's complex, uh, and it's expensive, and they just do not want to, to spend any money uh, in this current economic climate, which I think is, is very short-sighted. We've heard all about the health impacts of air pollution. They have a really a real cost on, on human lives, which actually the bean counters, the, the economists, can actually put, put numbers on. You know, they can tell you that, for example, every year air pollution costs UK society between 12 and 18 billion pounds. So there's a very real cost. We've got a right to clean air, albeit a very flimsy right. I think it's, it's a right that's really in its infancy, it's, uh, it's embryonic. Um, so it's, it's really important that we try and defend that right uh, and don't let... We, we, we make sure that the courts enforce the right and we make sure that governments aren't allowed to water it down. Um, that's about it. I'll uh, take any questions. Over.